Okay, so if you've got a patient with massive PR bleeding, so, uh, and, uh, you know, PR bleeding, I'll, I'll be general for the moment, can be anything from black to bright red, where could it come from? Sue. Sue, it could be coming anywhere from the GI tract. Uh huh. Such so, a. Did you say it was bright? So, what colour did you say? Well, at the moment, I'm keeping it general. Um, uh, it can be anything, anything from black to bright red. Yeah, so it could be coming from the stomach, it could be coming from a large bowel, it could be coming from a small bowel. Good. Okay. So, some historical features as to where it's more likely to come from, Jerry? Uh, so, if it's black and tarry, you're thinking higher up, so yep. um, sort of proximal to. Um, I think it's the ligament of treats, is what they classically say, I might be wrong on that. Look, anywhere in the, anywhere before terminal ileum, terminal ileum, and it can be black, because it just means that um, the blood's been able to be digested, and um, during the digestion process, that's where the colour changes occurs. How is the ligament of trites relevant, Cameron? Um, the embryological origins and the blood supply. Ligament of trites is a landmark for hematemesis. So if you've got hematemesis, then the bleeding is almost certainly proximal to the ligament of trites. Okay. Um, so the history can give us an indication where the bleeding is from, um, so the colour of the blood, as you suggest. Um, but it's not 100%. So if we've got hematemesis, obviously yeah, it's going to be proximal to, ble to ligament of trites and they're more likely to have melina. If you have bright red PR bleeding, um, it's more likely to be from the large bowel. But can bright red PR bleeding come from the small bowel or the stomach? If there's enough volume or the bowel transition time starts enough? Yeah, absolutely. So you always have to keep in mind that even if you see bright red PR bleeding, um, it can come from the upper GI tract. Um, if there's been a bit of time between when the bleeding has occurred and bloods are done, is there anything on the blood test that might give you an indication where the um, bleeding is coming from? Urea? Yeah, and how does that go? Um, it shows that the patient's had a large protein meal, which we're assuming therefore is digested blood. Yeah, good. So raise urea creatinine ratio. All right, so the workup for PR bleeding, um, I'm just going to go straight to the surgical management. We're, we're going to assume that we've done all the resuscitation, we've done some bloods. Um, how do we work out where the bleeding is coming from and what is the eventual management? So someone presents with uh, uh, large volume, bright red PR bleeding, they've had some symptoms to suggest uh, hemodynamic instability, whether it's lightheadedness or frank shock. They've been resuscitated in ED. Um, how are we going to work out where the bleeding is coming from? Yeah. Sue? Yeah, so, yeah, so what imaging options do we have? Yeah, CTMA. Yeah. I can do a so what are the CT mesenteric angio show? It shows you like the blood supply to the mesentery. Yep. Yeah. And how does that help us work out where they're bleeding from? Not looking to catch a blush of contrast. Yeah. And how fast do you have to be bleeding to better catch a blush of contrast? Jerry? I'm not sure. I wouldn't even know which units to use. Like this is a, yeah, mil per minute. Uh, 20? One. One mil per so yeah, one, so one mil per minute, sort of you know, 60 mils an hour. If they're bleeding at that rate, then you should be able to catch it. So they have, unfortunately, they have to be actively bleeding and um, they have to be bleeding at a mil per minute. And if you catch that, you're likely to find that exact source. Now, um, once you've found the source of bleeding, what are you going to do with it? How do you treat it? If they're actively bleeding on your CT mesenteric angiogram, 
Well, you could go to interventional radiology and embolize it. Yeah, good. So if there's a bleeder, then you can go to angioembolization. And how do they do it? Femoral artery stab, yeah. angioscope. Yeah. And how do they block it off? Um, they use a combination of therapies that can use like coils yep. or bone glue. Yep. Um, they like it. No, they can't lie again, no. but yeah. And they try to angioembolize as distal as possible because why would they want to angioembolize as distal as possible, Sue? So, as close to the bleeder oh. as possible. So, what are one of the complications of angioembolization? Ischemia? Yeah, ischemia. Yeah. So, if you angioembolize too well or too much, then then you can, in addition to stopping the bleeding, you can actually make part of the bowel ischemic. So that's one of the things you look for on the ward round after they've had an angioembolization, whether or not they've got new abdominal pain. Because typically, someone with massive PR bleeding, do they have abdominal pain? And do they have any abdominal tenderness? Generally not. Generally not, no. If they do have abdominal tenderness or abdominal pain, and they've got PR bleeding, one, the PR bleeding is usually much less. You generally don't get large volume PR bleeding with abdominal pain and tenderness. But what else are you thinking about if they've got abdominal pain, tenderness and PR bleeding? Perforation. No. Ischemia. Yeah, some type of different process. Usually a colitic process. So an infective or inflammatory colitis. Um, uh, yeah, and you're, you're sort of thinking something different there. What are the... So your CT angio has shown the bleeding part. What are the likely underlying causes of a massive PR bleeding where they're not tender and they're pain free. Polyp or any advances on polyp? So Cameron. Like Lucy. generally they lower volume. Lucy's not paying attention. <laughs> <Classic Sorry. policy. laughs> um so um, what were we up to? Polyps. Polyps. Yeah, what would the most common cause of PR bleeding? Massive bright red PR bleeding where the patient is pain free and non tender. Yeah, diverticular. And then less commonly, um, angiodysplasia. And then far less commonly, malignancy or polyps or something like that. The, with the exception being a post polypectomy, you can get massive bleeding from that, or you know, post hemorrhoidectomy, you can get large volume bleeding from that. So, you know, if they haven't had any recent surgery, haven't had the hemorrhoids done, haven't had a pop taken, most commonly it's done to <coughs> um, We've talked about angioembolization and we've talked about what we look for on the ward round afterwards. Now if you're in a smaller hospital like Griffith which doesn't have angioembolization and, and, um, uh, and they get PR bleeding, in the olden days before angioembolization the treatment used to be... Sorry? used to be just sitting and waiting. Because, provided they're not on you know, aspirin, clopidogrel, warfarin, some NOAC, um, what are the chances that a PR bleeder will just stop by itself? Pretty high. Yeah, how high? 90%. Yeah, 80 90%. So that's what we used to do. We just used to sit them on the ward, give them blood transfusions uh, every few days. We'd sort of stop at around six to somewhere between six to 10 units, depending on the patient. But we used to just wait for it to stop. And in 80% of the time, it would stop. Obviously now we've got angioembolization, so we make use of that. And angioembolization works in Lucy, Sue, Jerry, about the same, probably 80%. So 80% of people will stop bleeding by themselves. If they don't stop bleeding by themselves, send them to angioembolization, probably another 80% will get fixed there. And if they still bleed from that, um, then what options do you have after that? Yeah, and which bit do you take out? I would have thought the bleeding. Part. Yeah, so you don't have to take all the bowel out. Yeah. But um, you um, you take the bleeding bit out. So you, you, know, you, you don't usually just take a small segment. You usually take the whole left or the whole right, depending on where they're bleeding from. And a question for <coughs> Lucy, who's a little bit more advanced than everyone else. Um, you do a anastomosis when you take you cut that bit of bowel out? Yeah. Look, 
The general advice is don't. I've done it once and leave. <laughs> and then I was told by a senior colorectal surgeon that he never um, and anastomoses um, following a bowel resection from PR bleeding. Um, usually, uh, the physiology in the bowel changed somewhat. Um, there's, a, uh, there's probably generalized vasoconstriction in all the blood vessels there as a you know, bodily response to PR bleeding. Um, so um, the blood flow to the anastomosis is going to be different. So always bring out a stoma and you can always rejoin down the track. Um, if you can't find a source of PR bleeding, um, what else do you do? What other tests are available? Um, we don't have necessarily available here, but like red cell scans? We do have red cell scans available, not in this hospital, but certainly um, at Calvary or at Regional Imaging. They've got nuclear medicine there and they can do a red cell scan. Um, but how useful is that? Yeah, not really so useful. So, if there was, so the idea of a red cell scan is it can pick up bleeding if um, it's bleeding at less than one mil per minute. But one, the patient has to be actively bleeding. And then two, um, have you all seen what a nuclear medicine scan looks like, whether it's a HIDA scan or a, or a, or a um, BQ scan or anything like that? Quite low resolution. Yeah, you sort of have this fuzzy picture of, you know, something somewhere. And so, uh, in most surgeons' experience, it hasn't been terribly helpful in terms of working out where the bleeding is. People have taken out the wrong side of the bowel because a red cell scan has seemed to indicate that the bleeding was on the right and the left, only to find that the patient still had pre up bleeding and you end up having to take out the other half of the bowel down the track. So we don't tend to use red cell scanning that much. Any other investigations or tests that may or may not be useful? Well, they call, sorry. Yep. Would you do like a some sort of scope. Yeah, look, a colonoscopy, um, and there's lots of reported places in the world which do that. Um, depending on how unwell they are, if, if they're relatively well, you can even bowel prep them before you do the colonoscopy. If they're if they're somewhat less stable, um, you might just have to um, give them an enema and wash out the colon on table while you're doing it. And the advantages of doing a colonoscopy are that. Yeah, sometimes you can be therapeutic. You can sometimes put a, there's a diverticulum, there's been reported, I haven't done this myself, but there's been reported cases where you can put a, um, a, um, a rubber band over a bleeding diverticulum and that sorts it out. You can also use diaphragm or other tools, therapeutically. Any other questions or queries about large PRB? Sometimes in the workup, if the if the if the PR bleeding has settled down, regardless of what technique you use to settle down, what do you have to do down the track? Scope. Yeah, just to make sure that you why why do you do a scope? Yeah, or malignancy or something like that. Even though, as I said, it's unusual for malignancy to present in massive PR bleeding. Um, some say you've got to rule that out. If there's if they stop bleeding and you're still not exactly sure where the bleeding source was from, well, that test we can do at the same time as your colonoscopy. Yeah, you do a gastroscopy as well. Any other questions or queries about PLB? I'll leave it for the moment. I'm sure I've missed out one or two things. I'll put it up on the website and other people can have a look at it and then point out where the tube has been short. Hmm.